Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler, and in today's video, we are going to do an introduction to evolution. This is a new series of videos that are going to replace my old videos, and I'm going to update these ones now with you. Now, if you're new here, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe and turn your notifications on because I post every Tuesday and Thursday for grade 8 to 12 biology. Also, if you're new here and you're thinking about joining my membership because you would like to get 80% or more in your final exams, don't forget to click the join button that you can find on my homepage. There you'll get access to extra videos, my notes, live lessons with me, and so much more. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this particular video is replacing my older videos on evolution. Um, it's just an updated version. So let's look at, first of all, this diagram in front of us, which is called a phylogenetic tree. You need to be very comfortable in reading these when we go through evolution because it's how we express evolution, um, which is quite abstract. And we, we express it in this physical um, diagram way. And essentially, a phylogenetic tree is showing us how organisms have evolved over time. And each of these branches that we see here on the diagram represent a point at which something dramatic happened on Earth, and it led to a group of organisms arising. In other words, they descended from somebody else. And so every time there's like a little notch in our little tree over here, it represents also a common ancestor. Some particular um, organism that was very key in evolution that we have left behind and that we have created a um, newer version of that organism or that old common ancestor could still even be around today. Now, the last basic thing we need to know about phylogenetic trees is the fact that they are showing us essentially a timeline. We're starting from the oldest organisms and we're moving upwards to the newer organisms and also the more complex organisms generally, not always the case. Now, in this diagram, there isn't a time scale, but please know in exams there will be. And generally, it is counted in MYA or millions of years ago. And they will ask you questions like, when did plants uh, arise? or when did slime molds arise? When did they appear? And so what you would do is you would look at, for example, slime molds over here. You would look at where do slime molds intercept with the timeline, and then you'd be able to tell them how many millions of years ago. But that's the basics of how to use a phylogenetic tree. Now we're going to briefly look at the evidence for evolution and for your tests and exams you need to know your four pieces of evolution which is fossil records, biogeography, descent with modification and genetics. Sometimes this is a question where they will literally ask you name two types of evidence used for evolution and these are the four that you can give. Now, if they don't ask for an example, please don't give an example. Um, and what I mean by that is if they say name two types of evidence. Well, you have four to pick from here, so only use these four. But if they said, name two types of genetic evidence for evolution, then you're going to say something like mitochondrial DNA or DNA and RNA. You're going to actually give examples of each of these. Now, the first piece of evidence is the fossil record, and the fossil record shows us three important things that we will need to know for the exam. The fossil record shows us that organisms over time become more complex. In other words, their structures are more complex. They become more diverse. In other words, we started off with simply being a simple uh, group of cells like protists and bacteria, and now we have arms and legs and eyes and so many complex tissues. So we've become complex and we've become diverse, meaning we don't just have one kind of um, cell or one kind of bacteria. We have millions uh, of different kinds of microorganisms. We have thousands of different kinds of birds and reptiles and mammals. And so what the fossil record shows us is that with time, organisms have become more complex and they've become more diverse. 
The third and final thing that the fossil record supports when it comes to evolution is what we call transitional fossils. Transitional fossils are fossils that show organisms that seem to be an intermediate or a mixture. And examples of these are things like the Archaeopteryx, which is a mixture between a bird and a reptile. It has characteristics that we see in both groups, and so we consider it a transitional fossil. And what these transitional fossils show us is organisms that sit somewhere in between the two that allow us to then draw out these family trees that we see alongside you, these phylogenetic trees that we have here. Now, some of these fish may no longer be around. For for example, all of the fish here that have the cross next to them are extinct. However, they are all important key transitional fossils that we have found that then allow us to draw a full family picture. The remaining fish here, the ray fin fish, lung fish, and living tetrapods, those are the organisms we still see today. And we have their earlier ancestor fossils available to us. Now, in the exam, you are going to be expected to explain what a transitional fossil is. So you need to be prepared to explain that it is a fossil that exhibits uh, physical structures or phenotype uh, similarities that make them an intermediate. In other words, they have a mixture of two different phyla or um, two different groups of organisms. The next piece of evidence is biogeography, and as the name suggests, it references how uh, geography of the land has influenced the organisms that live on it. And what you're looking at here is when all of the southern continents were still attached to one another, and you see areas of fossils that are shared amongst um, these continents. Now, this is only possible if at one point all of the continents were attached to one another, and this supports evolution because what it says is, there's no way that an organism could evolve to look and behave a certain way if um, it's found in multiple locations with massive seas and oceans in between the land masses. There'd be no way for this organism to look the same um, if it was divided into different populations across giant oceans. And as an example to illustrate this, if we looked at the Listosaurus, it was found across the African continent over Madagascar, India, and then Antarctica. So this is all where we find this fossil. Now, the fact that we can find the exact same fossil for the exact same set of years, it only leads us to believe that when the Listosaurus first originated and evolved and appeared in these regions, the land was joined together, which supports evolution because it tells us that when the Listosaurus was alive and it was adapting and evolving, it would have had to have done so over the same land mass. Because if the landmass separated and took the Listosaurus with it, which it to some extent did when India and Africa and the Antarctic separated, those organisms would start to experience evolution independently because their populations would be too far away from each other for them to interact or to interbreed with each other. The next piece of evidence is modification with descent, and as the um, name suggests, it refers to how structures and organisms have modified over time and as they've descended from their common ancestor. And we have a perfect example of this when we look at the left-hand picture showing something called the pentadactyle limb. It is essentially the limb or the arm bone in most of these organisms that is a similar structure. You'll notice that they've highlighted the bones that are the same, the humerus, the carpals, metacarpals, the phalanges. But you'll notice that they have changed slightly. They have modified. And their modification um, represents um, a need to change in order to be suited to their environment. Now, remember, these organisms didn't want to change. They didn't force themselves to change. And we're going to go into more detail about actually how does this come about when we look at natural selection. But when we talk about modification with descent, we are talking about homologous structures. And these are structures like limbs, organs, skeletal structures that are similar in structure, but they serve different purposes. And the fact that they're so similar in structure can only point to the fact that they evolved from a common ancestor and therefore they're all descendant 
Now, this alternate picture I have on the side here is a modification with the scent, but this time moving towards um, modern elephants. And what it indicates is many different uh, groups of subspecies of elephants and also ancestors of elephants. So here is the current African elephant and the current Asian elephant at the very end. They are both alive currently. But everyone beyond that, or should I say below that, no longer is alive. They are extinct. However, what this diagram shows us is it shows us an important aspect of common descent, which is a common ancestor. Now, common ancestors, they are key in showing genetic links. And more common ancestors means that they are more closely related. Now, what does that mean for us in this diagram? Well, common ancestors represent these individuals here, these little points. And these common ancestors, all the way along, wherever we see a little branch off, represent a key change. Something had happened in the environment that caused a branch off to happen. And these fossils of all these other predecessors, these primitive elephants, if that's what you want to call them, they show us that we have modified the elephant over time. Some of the elephants have survived until this point, which is where we see our current two elephants now, but other elephants have become extinct for a variety of reasons. It may be because of their habitat has disappeared, or perhaps they've become extinct due to ice ages like the mammoth. But what we see here is modification over time and you are descending to where you are now. In other words, what groups are still present on Earth? Now, the final piece of evidence is genetics. And when we speak about genetics, we are speaking about two major aspects about what genetics can share with us. And the diagram, I have a very simple uh, uh, outline here of all of the percentage uh, genes that we share with other animals. Um, we share 99.5% of uh, our genes with chimps, 75% of our genes are shared with chickens, even 60% of your DNA right now is exactly the same same as a fruit fly. And so how does genetics support evolution? Well, the first thing it does is it shows us that genes and common ancestors must go hand in hand. We have to have a common ancestor in order to share genes. And so all organisms have DNA or RNA in some fashion, which means we must be related to each other. There's no alternate. And the fact that all organisms' genes cone for the same protein. In other words, the way in which a mouse makes muscle is the same way a chicken makes muscle, the same way a human makes muscle. We all make these same structures in exactly the same way, and that means we have the same genes. The second thing that genetics shows us is how related we are. And organisms are based on their uh, relatedness due to how much chromosomal or how much mitochondrial DNA they share. So the more chromosomal or the mitochondrial DNA we share, the more closely related we are, whereas the fewer chromosomal or mitochondrial DNA we share, the less we are related, the more distant we are. And so that's how we calculate relatedness. We see how much we have in common, and then how much we have that is different. And if we have more different, then we are obviously further related. In other words, our common ancestor was much, much further back. And that's basically what we see here in this uh, percentage of genes. It means that our ancestor with fruit flies was much older than that of the chicken, the mouse, and the chimp. In other words, our common ancestor with a mouse is much closer to us than the common ancestor between humans and fruit flies. Now that we've looked at the evidence for evolution, the final key piece before we look into, well, how does evolution actually like happen? We need to look at one more thing, and that is variation. There is variation at a species level. In other words, you can see variation between individuals, but there's also variation amongst an entire population. And so that means we need to look at all the differences between the individuals as well as the differences within population. And these variations that we see in our genes and our genetics helps evolution take place. Now, these two words that I'm about to go through now, you must know off by heart for your exams, and you need to put some key words in their definitions if they ask for it. The first one is species. Species. 
Now, a species is a group of individuals that are able to breed amongst themselves and produce viable offspring. Viable means that their offspring are fertile. They can make more of themselves. An example of that would be like two horses uh, reproduce and uh, they make a fertile offspring, a fertile baby horse. However, if you mix a horse with a zebra, which you can do, they will not produce viable offspring. In other words, the mixture between the horse and the zebra, the zorse, um, will not be able to make more babies on its own. Each time you would have to have a horse and a zebra um, combining together. The second word we need to know is population. Now, it's slightly different to species, but you've got to see the nuances and the difference. A population is a group of individuals belonging to the same species who uh, occupy a particular habitat. It means they live in a particular place at the same time and are able to reproduce and again produce viable offspring. The same time and same place is important. So the particular habitat and the time is important because you can have a population of elephants in uh, Kenya and then you can have a population of elephants in South Africa and you have got to know which population you are talking about. They are the same species, they're just in two different locations in two different perhaps time sets. But these two populations could still meet, one in Kenya and one in South Africa, and they could still reproduce with each other. Now, when it comes to the variation that we see in these species that we have mentioned now, there are two types. Um, if we're talking about variation in a species, you can have continuous variation or you can have discontinuous variation. And it's pretty self-explanatory by these pictures, but essentially continuous variation means there is a continuous or endless amount of possible combinations and lots of in-betweens. And eye color is a perfect example of that. These are just some of the uh, eye colors that we see in humans, but anyone can be a mixture of these and, and even newer colors that aren't on here right now can appear, especially if we're mixing our eye colors together. So it's continuous. On the other side, we have the peppered moth. And it shows discontinuous variation because there's only two options. It's either a black moth or a white moth. And they're both the same species. However, they just come in two colors. It's discontinuous because there's no in-betweens. Now, as always, I like to end off the lesson with a terminology recap, and you can use these words for flashcards and to study from for exams. We looked at the evidence that was used for our evolution, and we've got fossil evidence, which shows, of course, complexity and diversity changing. We then looked at biogeography, which was the locations in which we find those fossils and how those prove that they evolved together at the same time. We have descent with modification, which is the change or the modification of a organism's structure um, that shows that they originated as one structure and it's changed over time in different animals for, for different reasons. And those particular structures are often called homologous structures, as I showed you with that arm that we can see in many different mammals, but also birds and amphibians. Then we looked at genetics, which showed us how our similarities in our DNA link us together and how much we share. Um, it makes us more or less related. We spoke about common ancestors who are organisms that are shared in our family tree, and they represent organisms that have... Um, characteristics shared by our ancestors that we don't necessarily see today alive, but they were alive at one point and they exhibit physical characteristics that are in us, but also in other um, relatives. We spoke about variation, which is the differences within ourselves and in our genes. And we looked at variation in a species versus a population. And we looked at those definitions I forgot to mention continuous and discontinuous variation. You remember that continuous variation speaks about like eye color and height with lots of in-betweens, whereas discontinuous speaks about our either ors. Either you have it or you don't. We saw that in the peppered moths, they're either black or they are white. And these kinds of variation leads to opportunities for evolution to take place. Now, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And I will see you all again soon. Bye.